And on today's show, why advisors should look at deferred compensation plans. Part one of this week's series on deferred compensation with Regional Vice President of Business Owner and Executive Solutions, Sherry Flint. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial economist and contributing author to Backroom Technician and Insmark. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Sherry. Good morning. I gotta tell you, deferred comp, um, when I came into the business 30 something years ago, uh, it was hot. I mean, we were doing deferred comp all the time. You've been in the business almost as long as I have. You've been, you're a CLU, you've been doing business uh, deferred comp. You're doing all sorts of actually business solutions. Been in a long time. Why do you think we're looking at this? All of a sudden I'm seeing some kind of a, a renewed uh, appetite for looking into deferred comp by advisors. Well, I'd say there's two things that is, are driving this marketplace. One is, um, more than ever before, it's important to help people save for retirement. And the number one reason we get asked to look at deferred compensation by plan sponsors is to help their key employees save for retirement. The second thing, which we all have experienced over the last 12 months, is the tax rate environment. So uh, participants really don't want to pay taxes. So they're looking for ways to defer money on a pre-tax basis and deferred comp's your solution. Okay, so let's say I'm a high paid exec mm -hmm. and I already have, my, my uh, employer has given me a, a really great 401k, mm -hmm. he's matching it, I love all that, but I'm in a high tax bracket and he wants to do more to keep me. Like It's almost like a retainer, right? So he's going to give me a deferred comp and I don't want to pay it, as you said right now, Texas, so maybe if I just delay taking my comp, Maybe we'll have a new regime in and maybe the taxes will change. So I'm willing to take the bet that, hey, I, deferring, and of course, if I defer it, it's going to accumulate and all those earnings are going to accumulate tax, that tax is deferred. Correct. So I like that. Here's another reason, though. I'm, not, I'm going to ask you some of these uh, questions here I have. I also have seen some headhunters recently start to use defer comp as another carrot to move one person from the one corporation to another. Mm -hmm. He says, well, they do 401k, they have great benefits, they have mm -hmm. DI, they have DI um, for your paycheck, mm -hmm. DI for your retirement plan, but now we're gonna also add on top of that a deferred comp plan because you're already maxing out and you're qualified. So all of a sudden now it's becoming a recruitment issue, it's a retaining issue for high-end execs. Have you seen the market kind of go down this road where we're, we're, we're just kind of waking people up to deferred comp again. You know, ever since the recession hit, um, things have been really slow and it's progressively picking up. But I would say employers are using it for all kinds of reasons. You said recruiting, rewarding, retaining, and now helping people retire. So I would say the last three years have progressively gotten better in the deferred compensation market. And I would say um, for most plan sponsors where they have highly compensated folks, they need to be looking at this as a competitive mm. employee benefit and a solution to help their participants overcome the limitations in qualified plans. Now, it's my understanding, uh, and most of it that I've read about deferred comp and, and when I did it back in the day, really have a lot of options here. There's several mm. plans here. It's not just a single shingle idea here. Talk to me a little bit of how, what's out there. Plan designs are very flexible now. What we see in the marketplace is for participants allowing them to defer not only their salary and their bonus and their commissions and incentive compensation, there's oftentimes an employer contribution that can be tied to a vesting schedule. What's great about the plan designs now is participants can save for retirement, they can save for college education, they can save for a vacation home. So each person every year gets to decide how much they want to defer, when they want to back, and what investments they want to allocate towards each of those buckets of money. Okay, I thought I heard something new there. So I, I get the retirement, mm -hmm. I get the recruiting and retention, but did you just throw in, hey, well, they could opt for college education. They can, Absolutely. And that can be part of the comp plan, so it doesn't necessarily have to be retirement. That's exactly right. So well, they're very, very flexible. Well, I think there's a lot of needs out there that are outside re retirement that you just named. I mean, how many more are what I would call odd? Because I usually think of deferred comp only in the scope of retirement. And that's traditionally where we saw most of the deferred compensation plans, but over mm -hmm. time they've become to look and feel more like 401k plans and definitely giving participants flexibility on the timing of how and when they receive mm -hmm. their money has become more and more important. Does it matter what kind of companies do this? I mean, does it matter if it's a C Corp, an S Corp, an LLC? Does it really matter? You know, that's a great question. I often get asked, you know, S Corps don't, uh, deferred compensation doesn't work for S Corporations. I would say when you're looking at larger companies, mm -hmm. and I define that as companies with 100 employees or more, you, you should be looking at deferred compensation as an option. S Corporations do it, LLCs to a certain extent, and C Corporations. I would say the key to driving factor is, you know, can the company forego a current deduction? And is that loss of that current deduction more important than the benefits, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you kind of weigh the options. You know, do I need a competitive benefit mm -hmm. program? And um, does it make sense for the corporate structure? Back in the day, I, is this all under the governance? What is it, Section 
409 mm -hmm. Cap A. Cap A. Talk a little bit about what does that actually cover? What's the canopy on that? Well, this came out in, uh, actually went into law in 2009. It was voted in in 2005. And essentially what it says is a company has to have a plan document. Uh, they have to adhere, adhere to certain rules. And it actually started mm -hmm. with the whole Enron scandal where um, high-level executives were accelerating their benefits. And it basically provides us a premise of what you can do and what you can't do for rules and regulations. You can't accelerate benefits, so you just can't pull your money out whenever mm -hmm. you want. You have to um, make elections to defer in advance of receiving money. So there's certain rules we have to adhere to. The key with the penalties are that if you are found out of compliance with 409A, the participants can get a 20 percent penalty on their account oh, not good. and they're forced to distribution and there are state penalties in many cases. Is there any pending legislation right now? There's some stuff going on in this. There is pending legislation from the House Ways and Means Committee and um, we're not sure that it has legs mm. but certainly all the insurance companies have rallied around it and all the plan mm. sponsors or plan deferred compensation plan providers. It's really, really critical that everybody gets behind this. What it essentially would do is eliminate deferred compensation deferrals after 2014 and force any current uh, distribution, any current plan balances out by 2023. And so essentially it would eliminate deferred compensation plans for those individuals that really can't get the full benefits out of 401k mm -hmm. plans and Social Security. Has this got any legs on it? We don't think so. Um, you know, where all the companies are mm -hmm. rallying behind it, uh, we think that this first time around that it's, uh, it's going to be a non-issue. Mm -hmm. But again, it's something really important mm -hmm. to keep our eye on. When we come back, I want to keep moving down this road because I hope, I hope it doesn't have legs. Uh, I, I want to look, talk about a little bit about the retirement gap and how this fills in some of these areas that we, when we're doing planning, we'll be right back after the break. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. Uh, Sherry, we're going to talk about this retirement gap. I mentioned it just before we uh, broke for commercial. Walk me through this chart because I think this is kind of amazing. And if you guys want this, say, Steve, I want that. Just write me. I'll be happy to do that. Steve at downtobusiness.tv. I'll, I'll be happy to send you the whole file. Well, here's the challenge. So with highly compensated folks, it's very difficult to get to where they need to be at retirement with just 401k and Social Security plans. Financial experts say you should have 80 to 90 percent of your current income available as replacement income at retirement. And so you can see here, right here at about current income, that's about 150000 of income. And you can see with traditional 401k plans and Social Security, if we get full Social Security, that person's going to be at a 45% replacement ratio. So oftentimes what we're looking for are non-qualified plans to fill that gap. How mm -hmm. can we fill that income replacement? And so take a look at this slide. So in this example, we have a 45-year-old earning $130,000 a year, if they started with $100,000 in their 401k and contributed the maximum amount to their 401k plan for the next 20 years and earned um, an 8% rate of return, they're only going to have, uh, they're going to have a 45% replacement gap or 55% retirement gap. So what we do is we say, what can we do over and above the 401k mm -hmm. plan to help fill that gap? And so one of the solutions is a non-qualified deferred compensation plan. And I just want to stop you there because I think sometimes we mix this up. I've seen a lot of this online. When we're talking about non-qualified deferred comp, that's not like writing a life insurance policy that just is a supplemental retirement uh, plan itself. You know, a supplemental retirement plan is a deferred compensation, but it's not what we're talking about here. Right. This is going to be a plan that looks and feels like a 401k plan that allows participants to defer a portion or all of their income on a pre-tax basis. So it's going to look and feel like a 401k plan. It's going to be a defined contribution plan, mm -hmm. but it's a retirement benefit. It is deferred compensation as well. It's we're not gonna, deductible now. Right? It is not currently deductible. Okay. So here's what happens. Your money goes in pre-tax, it grows tax deferred, and when you take it out on the back end, it's going to be currently taxable. It's a great supplement to a 401k plan. It's not deductible, but it's not showing up on your 1040 either. Correct. Okay. It's going to reduce your current taxes, which as we know in this current tax rate environment is very, very important. Now this shows... Well, let me ask you this. I'm sorry now. You caught my interest here. Now, if I have an income where my, my client says to me, hey, I, you know, I really actually don't need this money. I mm -hmm. like the deferral idea. 
Could you, I thought I heard you say you could defer, I mean, all of it if you had to, right? You could. The plan sponsor dictates what you can and cannot mm -hmm. do. So if you had a plan sponsor that said you could defer 100% of your compensation, essentially you could. Now, normally we cap it at about 80 or 90% mm -hmm. because we don't want to have participants write a check back for their benefits right. or their taxes. So what we do is um, we just cap it at 80, 90%. Mm -hmm. But that sounds like a real, that could be a strategy right now with high taxes. You say, hey, listen, I really don't need this money. Might as well let it roll. No, I don't get the deduction, but hey, I'm not getting tax on it either. It lowers my tax bill. I drop down the effective tax brackets, maybe several. So, so when you're looking at this, do you see this as a play now? I mean, this seems, especially with taxation now, this could be huge. I would say the deferred compensation market is alive and well. And I would mm -hmm. say that advan uh, advisors should be looking at this as part of their strategy when they're working mm -hmm. with plan sponsors. How do they help employers attract and retain key talent? Competitive benefit programs are mm -hmm. a big part of that, and savings taxes is really hot right now. Now, you know, you're, you're an RVP for principal, and I want to make sure everybody knows that. Their documentation, their brochures, I, I always like to vote. I like who's the best illustrating company. I always like who's got the best brochures, who's got the best comp, who's got the highest target premium. I always like to kind of go down Steve Savant's little grid. But one of the big plays of principal is they have some of the best brochures I've ever seen. I used their entire brochure system during our DI month in May, about a year and a half ago. It was to die for, and advisors picked it up like crazy. So some of the actual PowerPoints, which, again, will not be showing in the show. If you say, Steve, I want the whole entire thing, we'll send it to you. Again, just write me at steve at downtobusiness.tv. Okay. Perfect. So this is a, this one shows a defined contribution and a defined benefit plan, mm -hmm. which aren't as popular. But the point being is that oftentimes when we layer a non-qualified plan, mm -hmm. we can help those participants get to that 80 or 90% replacement ratio mm -hmm. at retirement, which is really important in this marketplace. Now, do you get much pushback from the employer because he's not deducting any of this, right? You know, it depends. I mean, you definitely want to look for employers that um, have an interest in adding something to their repertoire. So when I look at the number one reason, as I mentioned before, that we get pulled into mm -hmm. conversations with plan sponsors is they're failing their 401k testing. What happens when they fail their 401k mm -hmm. testing is the highly comps can't get the full 17500 in. So oftentimes they're looking for a solution. So we want to look, work with, look for employers that are looking for a solution possibly failing their 401k testing where the highly comps are limited in how much they can save, or any situation where we have high net worth individuals making 200, 250 a year that are looking for ways to save on a pre-tax basis. Well, I think that you just gave us a, a hunting, I think you sent us on a hunting expedition right now. We're looking for, for companies that have highly comped execs mm -hmm. who are struggling. They can't, they're, they're already busting through the 401k limitations. They can't do it because of the percentages, mm -hmm. the discrimination rules. Right. So now there's this option. This could be uh, the, the actual demographic we're looking for. This is one of the many we're going to be talking about all this mm -hmm. week that you can look and target for deferred comp. Now, one, one last thing before we close out today's segment. When I'm looking at something like this, this you were talking about the combo plan, defer, defined benefit. Would this work with the defined contribution and de deferred comp, though? Could you do that, or would that be not as good? You could have, um, so you, a lot of companies will have a 401k plan, and probably the next most popular mm -hmm. item would be a, a non-qualified defined contribution plan. Once in a while, we'll see a defined benefit plan, but it's, always, it's not always mm -hmm. for all of the highly compensated folks. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, we do see that third plan, but I would say the majority of companies will have a 401k and just a traditional defined contribution non-qualified plan. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, Always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. Miss an episode? Just go out to our site at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. Want to email me? Steve at downtobusiness.tv. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.